Who gets to decide what's normal? And more importantly, why? Why even? When we work, we, we often have the make the joke, shouldn't we include some non-disabled people? <laughs> no, we should not. <laughs> All the regulations for inclusion and for inclusive education should just be practiced. They are there, but they are mostly not practiced and it should be improved. And this is our experience that you have to fight for a lot of things that make your life possible. For example, a wheelchair is really a part of my, my day, of my life. If I can sit in there for 18 hours maybe, or if I get pain after two hours, it makes a difference. Yeah. But that you need uh, personal assistance mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. And I think politicians need a lot of personal assistance <laughs> uh, yeah. in order to get uh, to get uh, in emotional or rational touch with the with the real people. Would you consider like a political career in any field? Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Standard Time. I'm Reiko Kingopop, your host and editor-in-chief at Eurozine, the force behind this show. Eurozine stands as a unique online publication weaving together over a hundred cultural journals and reaching audiences worldwide. We're also proud to be one of the founding partners of the Display Europe platform, showcasing European content in 15 different languages. Today we talk about disability and disabled people's right to self-determination, but let me start by laying out the ground a little bit. What counts as an able body changes throughout history, and even more from place to place. For instance, with my eyesight, in some countries I am considered legally blind, twice over. That has never stopped me from driving a car. Well, not having a driver's license has. Not having a car even more so, but that's not my point. Disability, physical and mental, acquired or congenital, have been with us literally forever. A growing pool of archaeological evidence, some dating back tens of thousands of years, show that amputees and people living with Down syndrome and many others have been integrated members of their societies across historical time. Some people were always born differently able and others were injured, hurt or otherwise affected. Disability is not an anomaly, it's simply a part of the human condition. But for disabled people to have self-determination and control of their lives, well, that's a tougher topic. Eugenics was an incredibly successful movement which characterized people as either fit or unfit, thinking that any deviation from what they designated as unfit would lead to genetic degradation. At the height of its success, people as prominent as Alexander Graham Bell, a deaf educator himself, argued for preventing the creation of a deaf race by forbidding marriages between people with disabilities, and Bell was actually one of the milder ones. About 250,000 people were murdered in the Holocaust simply for being physically or mentally disabled. Up until a few decades ago, institutionalization and forced sterilizations were usual treatment across Europe. Today, the situation in the European Union is vastly different. The EU guarantees a whole set of rights for disabled people and has initiatives like the EU Disability Strategy. The activists, self-advocates, NGOs and communities have played the biggest role in improving the situation, but it's still far from a bed of roses. Disabled people face a higher risk of poverty and social exclusion. In Bulgaria, up to 50% of people with disabilities remain in socially dysfunctional situations. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Croatia also record figures up to 40%. Women with disabilities in Europe also face a range of tough challenges. Disabled Survivors Unite, a UK-based disability rights NGO, revealed that women with disabilities in the UK are more than twice as likely to experience violence and abuse than others. They have a harder time finding a job, and when they do, they tend to earn less, have fewer chances to study, and struggle more to get the health care they need. Many live in households where work is scarce, especially in countries like Ireland and Belgium. And even those who do have jobs, like in Romania, still face a high risk of poverty compared to their peers without disabilities. 
Medical needs are another pressing concern. About 7% of women and 6% of men with disabilities in the EU report unmet medical needs, with even higher levels in some countries. A mere 2.3% of senior officials or managerial positions are held by women with disabilities. Today's guests lead the charge in this uphill battle, and they do not apologize for wanting a fair treatment. Bernadette Feuerstein is an Austrian disability rights activist and public official, known for her contributions to disability rights here. She has been playing an important role in the Austrian disability movement, including her involvement creating a barrier-free Austrian documentary on the topic. Balte Mattis is an actor, art therapist and a cartoonist. He's also a community worker and theater trainer who has worked with people with addictions and in penitentiary facilities. Maria Dinold works on the integration of people with and without disabilities into cultural life and to promote social inclusion through artistic activity. She is a deputy chairperson of Ich bin OK Association. She is also the president of both the Austrian branch and the European Association of Adopted Physical Activity. So let's see what it takes for disabled people to take matters into their own hands. Very welcome and thank you for coming. The most spectacular part of uh, disability integration are physical accommodations in buildings. These actually make everybody's life easier. Uh, I'm sure that it will be it will be a benefit for everybody. The um, uh, Vienna underground system had the old uh, cars with a step. Now they have the new ones without step. And uh, it's for every, everybody. It's easier to get out and get in. And so the Wiener Linie, the public transport system, stays safe. A lot of money with this. Is disability actually that rare, as we sometimes talk about this? I think the, the quote of people who are born with disabilities is not so high, luckily. But there are so many other uh, incidents that you can get dis disabled. But it is the society who is responsible to help. I think the, the important social thing is that the, the children are included and are seen as equal as other children and other persons. All the regulations for inclusion and for inclusive education should just be practiced. They are there, but they are mostly not practiced and it should be improved. Normalcy, or what we consider an able body, is an arbitrary thing. So it changes over time, the standard really changes. I wonder if this argument in your head rings true about it. I'm used to wearing glasses and wearing a prosthetic uh, uh, for a lifetime. I'm born this way. And um, because my, my kind of disability, you cannot see it at the first glance. So very often there was no problem at all. I was uh, kind of integrated at all. The prosthetic stuff, uh, it improved, I think, every year, and now it, it improves every month. New materials, new technologies. I have a, a sensor system. Many things are great, evolving very great, but I think in the, the conscience of the society, there's a lot to do, and we have to present us as, uh, as disabled people uh, we are here. We, we have to be visible. Bernadette, do you think disability is visible enough? Do you uh, find representation for, enough? For my opinion, it, it's not visible enough, but uh, it, uh, it's improved. When they built the underground system, there were only two stations who had an elevator. And, and it, wa it wasn't allowed to use the underground with a wheelchair. So it was necessary that uh, the community of dis disabled people uh, made, protested against this. And uh, we did strikes and we blocked uh, buses and so on. And with this system, you, uh, people have the possibility to get out, to move around. And so uh, they have the possibility to, to be seen. The understanding of disability is more wide. It, it grows. For things to change meaningfully, you needed to protest, you needed activism. So it's not like the benevolence of the state. Activism and self-advocacy plays a crucial role. 
in pushing uh, things it, forward. It, uh, the community had really a very powerful and important role. I recommend everybody to visit the uh, parliament in Vienna. It's really a very good example of accessibility. There it was an international day of, for people with disabilities. And uh, we were uh, thinking about that, I don't know, it may be, maybe 30 years ago, there was a hunger strike in the parliament to get equal law for people with disability. If, if I may add to this, I think uh, if you are a person with this consciousness of disability, but there are people, children or people who cannot speak for themselves. That's why the society has the duty to acknowledge the rights. And of course, if you can do it yourself, it's, it's, it's more effective because then they, they see exactly. But often the politicians, they, they don't want to see. When, when I teach my students, I always mention, okay, there is no special needs. It's we, everybody has special needs because he's an individual. And that's important, I think, yeah. I used a wheelchair for about two months when I broke a leg. And then you become very aware of the built environment around you. It was just such a harrowing experience. And this can happen to anybody at any time. But Maria, you also work specifically with physical education and dance and creative movement. And you work towards the integration of people with disabilities and very different abilities in culture so that it's not some peculiarity. Yeah. Can you tell us about this, please? Yes, I think uh, with, with our association, Ich bin OK, we, it, it was founded more than 40 years ago. The founder was Katalin Zanin. He, she was from Hungary, you know. <laughs> people with disabilities can also dance and they can express themselves. They have their... their special expression and they have their, their gifts and the need to express themselves and to move and to show what they can do, to put them on stage and put them in, in, the, in the view of the society. We do have an actor here with us in Walter who is, you know, as you meant, you pass, you, you, you know, you don't show like very visible uh, signs of disability having been born with one, and you are a successful actor. Does your experience as a disabled person play a role in your art? I think maybe I have a special sense for justice, exclusion, inclusion. This is a, a topic, I think I feel this all the time. I, I work with a, a acting company with uh, disabled people also. They are they are now founding a kind of academy for for uh, for uh, acting an acting school acting academy, and I'm one of the teachers. When we work, we we often have the make the joke, shouldn't we include some non-disabled people? <laughs> no, we should not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the needs are so normal, there are no special needs. But does this kind of uh, social connection that you mention? Does this come with anything special that you observe, you pick up on? I read about children, asking children, staring children. I know this very well. I often go to the children, what's up? What do you want to ask? Yeah? But when I was a child and other children asked me, I didn't really feel comfort. Yeah, and many people talk about in activist communities uh, and, and marginalized communities that they don't want to have to educate everyone in the street. Like, you don't have that level of energy all the time. Yes. Bernadette, do you sense this? That people expect you to explain everything yeah. to them? Like I am forcing you now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, uh, that's, that's correct. Sometimes uh, I tell them interesting stories. Uh, I just invented. Um, <laughs> yeah. I will not ask anyone how it's possible to have sex. That's the weirdest For example, thing. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. ask about such intimate things. Yeah. It depends on my mood, how I answer. For me, it's one, one of the most important things uh, that you uh, let the children grow up together. I was in the lucky situation that my parents take care that I go to a regular kindergarten and uh, primary school and gymnasium. When I compare with my other uh, colleagues, with my disabled colleagues, they had sometimes when they came out from institutions, they had so uh, much uh, to do to overcome. <laughs> We are very thankful to our partner, the Alte Schmiede here in Vienna, for their support hosting the show. 
Located in the city's heart, the Alte Schmiede is more than just an art venue. It's a thriving center for culture, bringing together a lively community of artists and intellectuals. With its commitment to contemporary art and literature, the Alte Schmiede offers a lively forum for exhibitions, readings, and interactive workshops. To discover more about their exciting events, visit thealteschmiede.at. Bernadette, uh, you are one of the one of the important pole bearers for this goal of selbstbestimmt leben. In English, it's called independent living, uh, uh, and uh, we say in, it's easier in German selbstbestimmt leben, self-determined. I do not need uh, a doctor or a nurse or who else a physiotherapist uh, to tell me what is good for me and what I have to do. I know by myself how I will uh, arrange my life, how I will organize. And for example, I'm here today with my personal assistance because I need a lot of assistance. I will not be live alone, but with the assistance of a personal assistant. Maria, when, when you worked with disabled uh, dancers, or not just dancers, anybody in, the, you know, in, interested in movement, that means that uh, they have a physical disability, but they don't want to abandon physical activity. They want to have control and proficiency in this, and they want to express themselves. I think it's <clears throat> the, the, the question is, or the difference is, if you have a permanent disability, I think you cannot be healed. There is no therapy to, to, to get non-disabled. But you can also get a lot of uh, improvement of quality of life. In our association, we have um, many of these uh, young adults. Most of them then work in, in this sheltered workshop. They like to come to the dance and the, in the afternoon they are allowed or in the evening. But when we go away for, for taking them to, to Special Olympics or to, to some events, they have to get uh, permission from the, from the workshop and they, they don't allow uh, more than a certain amount of days. So just yesterday I had a discussion with the mother. The child, the girl was ill and then there was a re rehabilitation center and then she left a lot of time for, for the workshop. And so they said, you have to pay for the, for the, for the other days where, where she's not here. And this is stupid because these institutions, they get their money according to their, their, their persons who are there. And if they lose their person, they lose the money. But the person also lose the place. We always uh, try to, to be in contact with companies who are offered normal jobs or jobs for those who can work for five or ten hours a day. And they are very happy to have their, their work there. Maybe worth saying that a disabled person doing a job, they're not getting a favor for being able to do labor for somebody. When you uh, enter a new situation, a new interaction, and people don't know you in advance, do you have a, a strategy to introduce yourself or when you would introduce the fact that you live with a disability that people might not see? Or is that something that you just leave up to them uh, discovering? Is that something you lead with? Oh, depends on the situation, depends on the surrounding, depends on the person. Well, it depends, really. It's improvisation. <laughs> I improvise. But does this yeah. hinder you in a new situation where people don't know you? You said that they sometimes ask, you know, stupid questions or, or gawk. You like to talk to... No, different stories, as she said. Uh, sometimes it's a shark, sometimes it was a, it was a yeah. chainsaw. It's, ah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You teach German as a second language to adults. Yes. Can you tell me about this experience? Because you work with people who, who come to Austria and start to learn German as adults, uh, sometimes not necessarily on their own volition being here. You mentioned this. Um, this has to do with my, with my profession as an actor because the normal career of an actor goes this, and now I'm here, and so I have to find a way to pay the rent and so Teaching German, uh, another example, uh, that uh, accessibility is a benefit for everyone. So if you uh, use uh, easy language, you know, or easy reading, uh, it 
will not only help uh, people with maybe intellectual disabilities, but also people who are not uh, not uh, speaking German as a first language. Definitely, it's like the the ramps or the elevators for for people with broken yeah. legs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the same. Yeah. Mm. So I, I am aware that there are initiatives specifically in terms of language to provide better readability. That becomes way more crucial when it comes to dealing with institutions. How is your experience in dealing with these institutions? Of course, we have the mobility aspect, right? Like the, the building has to be accessible. Bernadette, you're already waving your head, so I think you have a lot to say. I think it's also uh, getting better because as authorities are uh, understanding that it's uh, important to reach the people they are dealing with. For example, I, I know from the social ministry where I'm working, there are some pages in easy reading. Those who are uh, working in the healthcare system, for instance, or in culture, it seems important to have the connection between the theory and the practice, so that you, you have a lot more knowledge but you, you have to adapt and to, to apply what, what you learned in the way so that the persons are understanding and can, can act as they're not. Healthcare sometimes can be a conundrum in its own. So how is your experience with going through these systems? Uh, do you experience any different kind of treatment, Walter, for instance, you? Well, the, the, the normal health uh, insurance they they will pay me only the the minimum, maybe just a stick. The insurance for for the for pension, they will pay me some better advice for the system for this sensor system uh, for the sock that gives me information about the contact to the floor. I had a uh, lot of phone calls with uh, with the health uh, insurance that. I want to have this. I need to have this. It's good for me, so they so that they that they pay it. They pay for it. This was a process, yes. But it's, you have to fight for this thing. I had to fight. It, yeah. it, it's it's uh, well, you have to really put effort in it. Yeah. yeah. And it is is our experience that you have to fight for a lot of things that make your life possible. For example, a wheelchair isn't it's a really a part of my, my day, of my life, and if I can use it or I cannot use it, and if I can sit in there for 18 hours maybe, or if I get pain after two hours, it makes a, a difference, yeah. Additional to the normal social uh, welfare, there is some associations like Licht ins Dunkel who, uh, who allow the people to get more. There should be more responsibility of the regular social welfare to allow special uh, equipment for those who need it and not to go and bid and have, have private uh, sponsors for this. Yeah, I think uh, Austria is one of the most richest countries in Europe, or I don't know, and uh, it must be possible that uh, everyone gets the maximum of support what is needed. Who should be the judge of this? Or what would be the appropriate procedure? People with disabilities should uh, on all uh, steps uh, be involved uh, in decisions. And uh, I'm sure that, that it will change. For uh, Independent Living Austria, uh, we, uh, we try to be involved in important political process. Uh, but then sometimes, it happened that uh, we put a lot of work and energy and knowledge into a project and at the end the politicians or the author other authorities, they uh, listened to us but they didn't uh, change their way. And this is really frustrating. So it's kind of for show that they... Yeah, yeah. They signal that they have given an audience and then... That's it, kind yeah, of. Yeah. Walter, when you say that you have had to fight for your accommodations and this is an ongoing thing, do you meet with people on the other side who understand your situation? Is it the institution more or is it the people more that keep, back, keep you back or, or give you a hard time getting through to what you need? I think it's, it's, it's part of the, the, the institution. 
an institutional kind of life not to move, uh, not to change, not to, not to support the people, so just to support the institution. That, that's, my, that's my impression. So it's not individual horrible people sitting there trying to give you a hard time? Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> But when you get through, do you, like, do, is it a situation where you can actually find allies or is it just something to just march through whatever happens? What is your experience? A bit of, a bit of this, a bit of that, yeah. I'm talking to people and uh, I get some support and help and, and comfort and, uh, yeah, sometimes I have to, to go through alone, yeah. It would be very uh, recommendable that th those people who decide upon this have a broader view. They should look about Europe and the world, how it is uh, managed and how it is possible. Difference between the regulations in Germany and in Austria, so that, that, that people with disability can, can be uh, employed. They, there is their regulation how many in, in a company has to be employed. If not, they have to pay uh, something. One company in, in Austria pays $55,000 per, per month because they don't employ people with disabilities. And in the same company in Germany, they have uh, regulations more uh, evident so that they overfill their, their, their duty. You thought that was all we had on disability? You couldn't be more wrong. We also have an extended conversation with the founder of the active amputee, Björn Ezer. Listen to it on the program of Gogarin, the Eurozine podcast. When it came for me to take the decision to have my leg amputated against the advice of most medical personnel, I promised myself, as far as you can promise yourself something when it comes to health, that I would not let the amputation stop me from doing things if there's no medical reason for it. I think it would be amazing. And something I would like to see is if globally mobility wouldn't be a luxury. In our conversation with Björn Ezer, we discuss prosthetics and outdoor sports, policy and advocacy, and why mobility mustn't be a luxury. I don't know how much attention you all pay to this, but there has been a rise of influencers talking about disabilities and chronic illness and social media, and some of them have huge followerships, and a lot of people are learning about uh, the intricate details of living with a disability or a chronic illness or any kind of health condition for the first time online. How do you feel about these people? Do you think it's something that, that helps the situation? Do you think this should happen in an, on a different level? It might be helpful, but it might be also uh, get into the direction of a freak show. For the young people who are, get a lot of influence by them, I think it could, could be very helpful to understand the situation and to learn. They probably don't want to learn these things from their parents or from the teachers because the teachers, they are stupid and they want to do their own things. Is there a specific place where you all would like to see more disabled people represented? In the politics. In politics, they should be more more visible. Our parties, they, they choose a special person who is responsible for the disability questions. Sometimes they just you, <laughs> choose a wheelchair user. There should be an, a, a continuous education to be also to become politician and to to stand stand for the, the case. I see, uh, Bernadette, you need uh, personal assistance mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. And I think politicians need a lot of personal assistance <laughs> uh, yeah. in order to get uh, to get uh, in emotional or rational touch with the with the real people. Would you consider like a political career in any field? Mm. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's an interesting field, but sometimes it's too exhausting. See, you're doing a lot of work and and nothing is changing. Bernadette, what is the political position that you would wish like? right now. I don't know uh, if I want really to take an important political uh, role because you, you are working in a, in a very complicated system and yet it's uh, so hard to change anything. It's maybe I think a uh, chancellor will be good for me. Okay, I support you. I don't, have, I don't have the right to vote, but if I did, you would have my vote. In the municipality, we have a commission 
for they are kind of councils for the authority of Vienna. And yes, I, I would like to be there to to tell them the new streetcar is is uh, is a catastrophe. <laughs> and as an actor, I would really like to show them what's going on. To like yeah. drag them on with you yeah, and yeah, have them yeah, experience yeah. for themselves. Yeah. For politicians, for designers, for for people who decide for us how this kind of uh, streetcar looks. But there is a, a specific streetcar that you have a problem with? Yes, the new ones there. The older ones there is, the, the floor is, is, uh, is, Level. uh, is leveled. And now there is no even ground. Crazy. Okay, that should have occurred to someone quite soon, right? Because yeah, there are everyone also is complaining about accessibility yeah. requirements there. And not, not only pirates like me are complaining about, also, also uh, older people. It's interesting you mentioned pirates because uh, when we talk about how disability should be more visible, there are these very like classic characters, uh, theater characters and characters in acting that are by default disabled. That's how you recognize them and the pirate would be one of them, the veteran would be another, right? Do you find these roles specifically suitable for a disabled actor? Or do you, do you ever get cast in these, any of these? Yeah, I did in the past, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you find them? Like when you have to sort of play into the character, is this comfortable for you? To be disabled actor is a kind of, uh, not disabled, it's a special yes. uh, qualification, kind of. On the other hand, why should a, a, a person with two legs not play a guy with one leg? Uh, I think in, 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 in most of the TV shows, there are two, two less uh, disabled, disabled people. Uh, talking about the uh, actors, I was uh, thinking about the cultural adaption. Who is allowed to play, play what? what? Yeah. <laughs> if a disabled person is allowed to play a not uh, disabled person. If, for instance, a person with Down syndrome can play the person with Down syndrome, it's it's, it's perfect. And also in, in, in music and in dance, I think it's, I really love to see performances with people who have no legs, for instance. I think we have to see more artists with disability in, in, yeah. the, in the movies yes. and yeah. in, in, yeah. In, in, in also in the in TV. Yeah, but I think it's um, a more uh, interesting to see a Romeo, a blind Romeo. I think disabled people can play not disabled people and not the other way around. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>